morning, everyone. It's really a joy to be here with you this morning. My name is Lorna, and this is Mari, and we just have the pleasure and honor of doing this all with you this, this day. Isn't this beautiful? Christmas. Christmas is here. Um, this story, well, first, first, first thing I wanted to say was thank you to everybody who came to the concert last night, who performed in the concert last night, who enjoyed the concert last night, who walked by the concert last night. It was just, it was an, a, a beautiful, beautiful um, celebration and, and sharing. It was um, in the afternoon. We know that there are people who weren't able to come. Um, but it's part of what we do here. It's a huge part. Out there on the sign, you see Ananda, and then it says meditation, yoga, and community. And um, meditation through our, our spiritual practices, our personal spiritual practices, is how we come to understand within um, what's really happening. Um, the teachings of yoga are what we share here. And um, again, community is how we do it. We do it together. We do it in a way that um, is not done, I don't think, in any other part of the world and any other part of the planet, to come together and share um, the truth and the inspiration that we all feel in such a way is just an honor and a privilege. And thank you, everybody. And if you missed it or you want more, we will be singing again um, at the Grotto, the Festival of Lights in Northeast Portland on December 16th. So we would love to have you all there with us. So this topic this morning, we've gone through this almost the entire year of these readings that Swami Kriyananda, the founder of Ananda, put together. And um, we're almost to the end of the year. And I think it's very sweet that he saved it almost till the last to say, what if we fail? <laughs> what if we can't do what it is that we, you know, what we want to do, that we're trying to do? And this story of the ten virgins, I tell you, from childhood, and when I heard this first story, is deeply disturbing. <laughs> it just, it really, it would upset me. I just didn't understand what it was all about. And I want to read you, it's just a very short um, chapter. I want to read you the actual one. Um, where what Christ said in Matthew um, chapter 25, then the kingdom of heaven will be comp comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil and flasks along with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout. Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the prudent, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, saying, no, there'll not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. And later the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered and said, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. So, like I said, the story was puzzling. I would get quite indignant <laughs> on their behalf. So, no, wait a minute. They realized their mistake. They tried to correct it. The other virgins, they were mean. <laughs> they, didn't <sh> <laughs> they didn't share their oil. They knocked on the door. The bridegroom was just rude and wouldn't open the door. <laughs> it was just, and then I thought, and that's it. That's, you know, um, as we all know, in most Christian churches today, they teach, they don't teach reincarnation and karma. They teach there's, there's one chance to do this. And I thought, that's it. They made their mistake. That's it. They have to live with that. Um, but when I came to this path and learned the teachings of yoga, of self-realization, of um, what in the East they call sanatan dharma, which means eternal truth, um, which is not a dogma that is 
circumscribed by a certain religion, but is um, the truth underlying everything, then things began to make sense. And to be honest, reading the entire Bible makes a lot more sense when you come at it from that perspective. Um, with the idea that um, we're not doing this in, in one lifetime. We're not able to figure this all out and get it right perfectly. Um, what, what came to me, I went to nursing school um, and had one incarnation as, as a nurse earlier in my life. And this, the idea of, of trying to do this all in one lifetime was to me like trying to go to medical school on a weekend taking an intensive, you know, and then coming out at the end of the weekend and taking your boards and, you know, and being expected to do it all right after your weekend of learning. It just didn't, you know, it didn't make sense. There wasn't enough time. But when you take into account a karma reincarnation that we're, we have countless lifetimes according to these masters, they teach that there's just millions of opportunities to get lost and to come back. And if you look at the story a little closer too, um, 10 virgins, I don't, I don't know. I, I, in my readings, I don't know what Yogananda has said about why 10. I don't know. My, my personal little theory is that it might be um, uh, metaphysical, that it might actually refer to the five chakras here. And each chakra has a positive pole and a negative pole. It has the movement can go either upward or downward. But that aside, he did tell us that the oil in the lamp represents our devotion. And when you, when you take it from that angle and look at the story again, the foolish virgins didn't have enough oil. They didn't keep their lamp. When they went to trim their lamp, you know, their devotion was lacking. And they went to the other virgins and said, give us some of yours, which, of course, doesn't make sense when you look at it from the devotion is our own. It has to come from deep within ourselves. We can't borrow it or buy it or get it from somebody else. It has to be of our own openness and our own heart that blossoms and lets that flow through us. And then they knocked at the door asking, let me in, let me in. And the bridegroom did hear them. And he answered. And he told them, I don't know you. Now, in my mind as a young child, it was like, I don't know you, you know? <laughs> but let's look at it a little different and say, hear him say, I don't know you. What is it to know somebody? What is it to know each other? What God is asking of us is a relationship. God is always asking us to come into relationship with him. And if we don't do our job, it's a, it's a two-way um, energy exchange. And if we don't do our job, then there really isn't a relationship. There isn't a knowing of one another. And that's what it is that we have to do. And relationships take time especially ones that are deep and true and lasting. They take time and energy. In our um, affirmation today of immortality, immortality is the lesson. That's the course that we're taking. That's why it takes so long. We're so attached and so identified with our smallness that to take a course in immortality and realize that we're deathless, changeless spirit that none of this is really who we are. It takes a long time, but that's what it is that we're studying. That's what it is that we're aspiring to, is that understanding of ourselves as immortal spirit. And Swami Kriyananda um, said that the single most important thing that we can do as devotees, Swami Kriyananda was the founder of Ananda, and he learned from Yogananda, he lived with him and learned from him. He said, the single most important thing that we can do is to not give up, is to not turn away, to not give it all up and say, can't do this, not go in there. And even if we do give up, it's only temporary. We give up for a little while, then we come back and we, and we start again. The story of Mukunda in the autobiography is really inspiring. Um, he, um, he shows us again and again in that book that um, what it takes. 
takes continually, continually trying, continually working on it, continually looking for his guru. Um, we, have a, um, we have a book group that meets um, once a week. This is the book, AY. This is mine. It's a little bit used. If you don't have this, if you haven't read it, I would urge you to do so. It's a treasury of spiritual truth and, and wonderful, wonderful stories. And um, one of our, uh, in one of our discussions, one of the members of the group had the honesty and the um, clarity to notice. She said, you know, there's a lot. What did she say? She said, I notice that in this book, as he writes about his experiences, he is often sobbing at the guru's feet or crying with devotion or the tears are coursing down his cheeks. He describes sitting in meditation with such intensity that he says his brain is going to explode. He talks about um, intently meditating, demanding of God, Mother, God and Divine Mother a response. I won't leave. I won't get up from my meditation until I get a response from you, which meant hours, days of meditation, just this intensity. And um, this woman in our discussion group said, I don't do that. <laughs> you know, she said, it's really interesting that he, this comes up again and again. And she said, I guess it takes a lot more effort than I thought. And that's, that's one of the lessons that we can learn from his stories in here, is that this spiritual path is, is not lackluster. It's not um, a middle path. This is for all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our strength to continue. And it's really exhausting. It's really hard to keep that up all the time, to keep going. We just, there's part of us that just wants to say, can't I just today not, you know? We need to keep going. And that's why it takes millions of lifetimes, according to what Yogananda says, because we do. We just, today, just not so much. I won't put, yesterday I put a lot of effort into it. So today maybe, you know, it takes effort all the time. The battle wages on. Um, I've been observing something at my job. I have a job at Home Depot. And um, as you can see, we're in the Christmas season. And those of you who have worked retail in the Christmas season <laughs> know know a little bit about what that's like. Home Depot is a really fun place. Um, part of the reason why um, Yogananda said he came to America was because of this can-do attitude, this, this American spirit that says, I can do anything, and why not do it now, you know, and I'll do it better than the other guy did it. And there's just this creative spirit, and, and you find that a lot at Home Depot. I'm just thrilled with all the projects people come in, they know nothing about what they're doing, and they're just going to do it. They're just going to get the right things. <laughs> if I just buy the right tool, if I buy the right, you know. Um, we had people, I had people coming in saying, I read this on the internet, how to build my own air conditioner thing. So I'm going to, I need to get this and other. And later it was, I read this on the internet, how I can build my own heater thing, and I'm going to get that. And I, and just, there's just a, it's a lovely, wonderful, creative solution consciousness that's there a lot. It's great fun. Um, but this time of year, I don't know, it, it's probably there all the time, but it's also coming out. One of the things that I've noticed lately also is a pervasive attitude that, that's in our culture, that's, that's here in America, alive and well, that says, I want it now, and I want it for as little as I can possibly get it. And I don't want to have to put out a whole lot of energy for it. And, and there's just this expectation, this sort of, um, you know, this, this sort of divine right or, or entitlement that says, I, you know, I should be able to get this. And um, we are, you know, we've been selling Christmas stuff since October. <laughs> so we're starting to run out of things. And so a lot of my time is spent explaining to people, I'm sorry we're out of that. I'm sorry. And looking up where they can go get it. It is really amazing to me how many people don't want to put out the effort to get what it is that they say they want. You know, oh no. The other Home Depot, the nearest one that we often send them to, is 4.1 miles away. It takes seven minutes, according to Google, to get there 
from our Home Depot, which is right over here in, in Beaverton, to the other Beaverton store. And yet, 99% of the time, if I tell somebody, oh, well, we don't have it, but you can go to this other store, and according to the information I have, they have it in stock. No, that's all right. No, you know, I'll just have to do without. You know? <laughs> and, um, you know, when we're talking about Christmas baubles and things like that, that's fine. But it struck me. I had a couple come in um, just the other day that were looking at all the Christmas trees and, and choosing which one they wanted. And I was struck by their interaction and by their energy. It was decidedly different than most of the people that had been rushing through, and, and different than mine because I was in the mode of, of getting things done. And they were very calm. They talked to one another. They communicated what they want. What do you think of this? What do you think of that? And I just kind of hovered a little bit to see if they needed help. And they decided on one tree. This is the one I think we want. And, and then, of course, we were out. So I said, well, you know, we can, we can look for it online. We can get it. Well, the only stores that had that particular item were Jansen Beach up north and Oregon City. And I have never, in the months, months that I've worked there, I've never had anybody say what they said, which is, oh, well, that'll be great. Yeah, we can do that. It's only either one. doesn't matter. You know, 20-minute drive. We can go up to Oregon City. We can go to Jansen Beach. Sure, we can do that. And I, I nearly you know, fell over. <laughs> and they did it with such calmness and such willingness. You know, of course, this is what we want, and we have to go 20 minutes to go get it, and we can handle doing that. And I thought, you know, if you're not on the spiritual path now, you're going to do really well when you get there. <laughs> because that's what we need, is just this willingness to put out the energy to do what it is that needs to be done. If we want it, then we're going to have to get there. We're going to have to do what needs to be done to get there. Um, this wonderful Christmas scene and the song that, we, that was sung earlier um, makes me think about the, the story of the three wise men at this time of year, an uh, integral part of the whole Christmas drama that we hear. The three wise men came from afar. The story is, we, we actually know very little about them except that they came. They came a long way from the east to visit the baby Jesus. Little side note you can take away with you if you haven't heard this before. Yogananda actually said that the three wise men were Babaji and Lahiri. consciousness, that to come and welcome, to, to, to take that journey is not an easy one, to come and to greet it and to actually welcome it into our hearts. And I would invite you to use the Christmas story as an as a inspiration for you. <coughs> and you can imagine yourself as the wise men making that journey, trying to reach the goal and welcome that newborn incarnation, that new awakening that we all have that starts to wake up and has to grow, it starts small and vulnerable and needs to grow strong, and be the wise man willing to take that journey and then to offer gifts, offer gifts of love, offer gifts of willingness, of acceptance, of energy, 
of constant energy into that light to help to help see it come alive in a stronger and stronger way. The other way that you can see the story is as yourself as that infant, as that new baby on the spiritual path. We're all just little children on the spiritual path. And see yourself as that little, little one who's just starting out, who has a long way to go, a long way to grow. And the wise men come. As soon as we turn towards God, the wise men come and rejoice and come to us and say yes. And they lay gifts at our feet, the gifts of community and satsang, the gifts of the meditation practices, the gifts of the great ones that have left us, these amazing gifts, to help us continue and continue to keep up the battle and to keep going so that when we fail and when we slip back, those gifts are there to help us keep going. And whatever role you play, however you want to look at it, the important thing to remember is that the spiritual path is here It's here as our journey home. And there's no way that we can get lost forever. There's no way that we can go off the path. We can wander, we can take side roads, we can stay and hang out, you know, at the cafe along the way. <laughs> we can find ways to make the journey long, but there's no way to get off the path. We're all children of life. We're all a part of all that is. There's no way that can change. So there's no way to fail. And we'll all, we'll all fail.